I want to add a couple of things uh, to what Paige mentioned just before we jump in uh, to the sermon this morning, a couple of things to make you aware of. One, on the, on the note of the block party, uh, I, th- I said this last week, but um, you know, we, I keep hearing about North Aurora. And by the way, North Aurora is one year old. So we call ourselves a family of neighborhood churches. This weekend, North Aurora is a year old. So we have a year old church who's part of our family. Praise God for that. <laughs> Next weekend, Mill Creek Campus turns five years old. So that's pretty awesome. I won't tell you how old South Street is, but really, really old. <laughs> but um, we, the, often our younger campuses, that are, they plan block parties, they do cookouts, they do fun stuff. And I thought, why can't we have a cookout at Kesslinger? I want to have a cookout, and so we are. So join us October 16th. Here's, on, on that note, we need some of you to help. We have four uh, men who have jumped in and said they will help with the grills. We need uh, probably four to six more. So if you're interested in helping us with that block party, you can stop by the uh, welcome desk on your way out. Just There's a sign-up sheet there. Let us know that you're willing to... Uh, Donate your grill and your time. You don't even have to bring your grill. I got a guy with a souped up truck who says, I'll pick them all up. So anyway, if you're willing to grill uh, uh, meats for us on that day, we'd love to have you serve in that way and it'd be a great help. The second thing I want to mention is um, several weeks ago on a Saturday night service, uh, Pastor Joe Scavato, some of you know Joe, uh, part of our, 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 he oversees groups in, here at Chapel Street Church. He was part of a residency, um, was a pastor resident a couple of years ago. But he also hosts the Saturday night service. Anyway, at the start of the service, he asked us to think about what we ask ourselves this question. What do you think God wants to say to you tonight? So I was praying about that. And I felt God say, look around, which is a little odd because why would, I, why, would I, why would he tell me to do that? I turned because I'm in the front row and looked and over my shoulder I see four or five people that I know who had asked for prayer and I saw living examples of, of answers to prayer sitting next to them. Grandson who had been sick, children who had twins that were born. And then in the back corner, I see Jenny and Matt Caterer and their baby girl, Kylie. And I felt God say to me, I still answer prayer. It was strange because I wasn't doubting that, at least not consciously. I wasn't aware that I needed to hear that, but I did. Shared that with our staff. Fast forward a week later, I see Jenny uh, at the same Saturday night service a week later, and she says, please pray for me because Monday I am restaged in terms of my cancer. If you don't know Jenny's story, you'll see an image of Jenny and Matt here on the screen, I believe, hopefully you will, of me with them. Do we have that image? Of me with Jenny and Matt Caterer. Anyway, there we are, after a Saturday night service and their baby Kylie Joy. Jenny was my administrative assistant, a remarkable woman of faith and a competent leader, and um, always wanted to be a mom. God blessed her with... uh, the ability to be a mom after a couple of miscarriages and some hardships, and this beautiful girl was born, and then two months into her, uh, Kylie's life, to two months old, Jenny's diagnosed with multiple myeloma, which is untreatable cancer. Uncurable, I should say. It's treatable, but it's not curable. We're all devastated. Many of you have been praying faithfully. And then uh, Jenny said, pray for me because I've had the stem cell transplant. Monday I get restaged. Some of you know this news, but I want to share it with you. I asked her if I could share... With, that, with all of you, in, in, in typical Jenny fashion, she sent me exactly what I should say. <laughs> so, <laughs> here's what she says. Eight months ago, when our baby was eight weeks old, I was sat across an oncologist who told me I had an incurable cancer. One week later, the largest tumor collapsed. My spinal cord and I was paralyzed from my ribs to my toes. The doctors told me I might never sit in the chair again, much less walk. In that moment, our world not only stopped, it crumbled. In the darkest days, the Lord surrounded us with his presence. We felt loved and held by our mighty God, even as we wondered if I would survive to see our daughter's first birthday. The church, many of you, poured out loving kindness on us through prayer and practical acts of service. You were the hands and feet of Jesus in our lives. We needed it most. The road has been long and hard, and the journey is not over. But I'm thrilled to share that I am in remission. She went from stage four to undetectable in her body in eight months. Yeah. I have to finish, she told me. <laughs> Furthermore, the Lord has miraculously restored my ability to walk. Jesus has given me physical healing to, the point, uh, to point to the truth that he alone gives spiritual healing. She quotes Psalm 22. I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. I will praise you among your assembled people. May God's name be glorified. Now, Jenny has another stem cell transplant coming up in October. Please keep praying. The journey's not over. And it doesn't always go the way we want it to go when we pray and the time we want it to go that way. But every now and then God reminds us that he hears, he answers prayer. And I was needed that reminder. Perhaps you do as well this morning. Speaking of that, let's pray. 
and ask God, who hears and answers prayer, to speak to us through his word. Father God, thank you for your word, which is living and active. Thank you that you're a God who's not far off or distant, but actively involved in our lives, closer to us than we are to ourselves. In you, we live and move and have our being. And if we're listening, you're always speaking. So speak to us now through your living word. Help us to hear and obey. We praise you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, are there any fans of Rocky movies here? The Rocky series? Few, few faithful? <laughs> I noticed not a whole lot of women put their hands up. <laughs> well, I love all the Rocky movies, and I know that they're not all that good. But sometimes when you get, you get like sucked into a series, you, can't, you have to watch them all. So Rocky 1, fantastic. Rocky 2, eh. Rocky 3, outstanding. And it kind of gets bad from there. But anyway, in the movie Rocky Balboa, which I think is the most recent one, I can't remember now. The Creed, they don't count, the Creed movies. Uh, Rocky Balboa has this meeting with his son, who he's just kind of estranged from. And he has this inspirational speech. You can YouTube it. It's, it's all over the internet, and people love it. Um, and he says in this scene, the, his closing words to his son, with his Rocky voice, you know, he says, I'm always going to love you, no matter what. No matter what happens, you're my son, and you're my blood. You're the best thing in my life. But until you start believing in yourself, you ain't going to have a life. Uh, his son was uh, complaining about the, how hard it is for him and kind of playing the victim, and Rocky's trying to motivate him. And he says, until you start believing in yourself, you ain't going to have a life. Life's hard. Knocks you down. you got to believe in yourself. Perhaps you've heard that or said that. I've heard that many, many times. We hear it all the time. It's an inspirational scene, but is it good advice? The question I want to ask as we're in our series called The Way, is that really good advice? Is that good life wisdom? Believe in yourself or you ain't gonna have a life. So much has been written and said about the power and importance of self-esteem, and I wouldn't, I think self-esteem is important, but where does it come from? Self-confidence, self-actualization, and the need to discover and be true to your true self. The older I get, the more I realize that my greatest obstacle in life has been myself. Can you relate to that? Nobody has lied to me more than me. Nobody has led me astray more than myself in my life. So if you can't trust yourself, who do you trust? If you shouldn't follow yourself, who do you follow? This is the central question we're gonna unpack in our series called The Way. You might remember we talked last week as we started this series that the early Christians, the early followers of Jesus were called people of the way in the book of Acts because they did not know how to categorize them or what to call them. They just lived different, the people of that way. And we looked last week at Jesus' clear and uh, famous, but not well understood statement, I am the way and the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father except through me. If Jesus is the way and we're going to follow him, then I would suggest the self, whatever that is, is our primary obstacle. If you want to follow Jesus, if you're serious about that, if it's not just church talk when you come uh, to worship, there's something in the way of you following the way, and it's you. Jesus would suggest, and I agree with him. So we're going to look at a couple of passages from Luke chapter 9. Luke 9 Verses 18 through 22. Jesus explaining a couple of things here. I want you to listen for the two central messages here in these two passages. Luke 9, 18. Now it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him. And he asked them, who do the crowds say that I am? So Jesus is by himself praying, and the disciples come and interrupt him. And they ask him, Jesus, and, and Jesus asked them a question. Who do the crowds, the people, say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. Others say, Elijah and others that one of the prophets of old has risen. So in other words, they say there's a lot of talk about you, Jesus, but nobody's exactly sure. Something John the Baptist, something Elijah, something one of the prophets, there's a buzz about you, but there's a lot of opinions. And that's kind of true today, isn't it? Everybody's got an opinion about Jesus. Then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, the Christ of God. Christ, the term Christos, meaning Messiah. You're the one. 
the long-awaited promised deliverer of God. And then Jesus strictly charged them and commanded them not to tell this to, to tell this to no one. Meaning, he says, it's not time yet. It's not, I'm not ready for everyone to know this. The Son of Man, which is the, his favorite title for his divinity, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. So, two primary things in this text that, uh, that Jesus, we, we learn here. One is Peter's confession of Christ. Jesus says, who do you say that I am? He makes it personal, and Peter gets it right. You are the Christ. So Peter's confession that Jesus is the one. He is God's Messiah. He is the deliverer. Come to save God's people. The second thing Jesus says, following that, so think about that. The, the, the disciples grew up waiting for Messiah, the promised one. Peter says, you're it. Jesus says, you're right. And his next words are, I must suffer, be betrayed, and die. We hear that, and it makes sense to us because we're looking backwards through the resurrection to the cross, and the story is familiar to us. We know how the story goes. Those two things did not at all go together for those first disciples. The Christ, yes, we knew it. Told you, he's the one. The Christ, the Messiah, was to come and conquer and to rule and to reign, not to suffer and to die. Those did not go together in their minds. And I think sometimes, and I'm guilty of this too, we become so familiar with the story that we miss the, the, the edge, the radical edginess and shock of what Jesus is saying. Because the truth is, there are things about Jesus right now that don't go together with how you think of him, with how you want him to be. What are those things? So with that in mind, let's listen to what Jesus says to us in the next passage, because this is the one we're gonna, we're gonna camp out on. Luke 9, 23 through 26. And he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Famous words. Certainly, verse 23 is, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. You've probably heard those things many times, maybe quoted them. But what do, how do we understand what Jesus is really saying here? Again, I think our familiarity can blind us to what he's actually saying here. These, these words would have sounded so incredibly strange to the disciples, especially this business of taking up your cross. We'll get to that in a minute. So what is Jesus saying? Fundamentally, you can, you can write this down if you want. Fundamentally, Jesus is saying this. You cannot follow him and yourself at the same time. You cannot follow Jesus and yourself at the same time. It's not possible. They don't line up. It's a fundamental impossibility because the way of Jesus and the way of self are totally opposed to one another. The way of Jesus is the way of the cross. And that's something that ourselves, apart from him, resist and reject and don't want. That's a problem for a lot of people. The Apostle Paul puts it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23. We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. The word stumbling block, obstacle, it's in the way. It doesn't make sense. A Messiah who suffers and dies, that does not compute. And to Gentiles, G Greeks, in other words, it's folly, foolishness. It's silly. It's ridiculous. A Savior who dies a shameful criminal's death does not fit with my worldview and understanding of what I want out of life. It's in the way. But Jesus says it actually is the way. I, I think part of the problem is we've sanitized the cross. We, you know, we wear them, we put them on things, and we tattoo them, and we make little cards with them, and we decorate them, and I like taking pictures when I was in England. I took pictures of all the crosses, the Celtic crosses in different graveyards, and that's cool. 
But it's, it, we just, it's just a cool symbol. But it was not that way to the disciples at all. It was ugly, horrific, brutal. Maybe, maybe like, a, I don't know what the right example would be. It's an instrument of torture and death and oppression and violence. For a first century Jew, a cross was like wearing a swastika. Now God has redeemed the symbol and changed it by his death and resurrection, but at that time, why would you put that on you? Why would you want that to be your symbol? But I, I believe God, the cross is intended to be a kind of dividing line, a quote-unquote crossroads. You, Paul says we want to remove every offense except the cross itself. In other words, we want to bring people to the, to the point of facing the message. Christ died for you because you deserve death and rose for you because he wants to give you life. Colossians 1.23, a ridiculous stumbling block. Colossians 1.24, which we didn't read, says, but to us who, are, who believe, Christ the wisdom of God and the power of God. It's one or the other. There really isn't a neutral ground when it comes to the cross. And that's part, of, I think, of the tragedy for us is people wear it and write it and draw it without really knowing what it is they're doing, what it means. So according to Jesus, you're either denying yourself and following him, or you're denying him and following yourself. And I know, if, you listen, if you're listening to me, some of you might be thinking, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't, I don't, you know, I'm not denying him. I'm just not sure I'm ready to follow him. It's one or the other. To, to, to take a neutral ground is to deny him because of his claims of who he is. I know this sounds harsh. Part of it is because our culture, we're just surrounded by these messages that are saying, love yourself, be true to yourself, protect yourself, trust yourself, listen to yourself, find yourself, defend yourself. And Jesus says, actually, deny yourself. Just, what? It's exactly the opposite. One of the best books I've read on this reality is a book by a guy named Carl Truman. I don't know how many of you are readers. It's available on uh, Audible or audiobook if you're not, if you like to have paper and pen. But, and it's not, it's, not, uh, it's not a quick read, but it's well worth your time. The book is called The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. It is outstanding. He, his whole premise is that this concept of self has come to dominate our culture, but we don't really understand it. We don't really see the f- cultural and so- social forces that are at play in our world today that have brought us to this point. We're just sort of swimming in the same water, being influenced and carried away by the currents without knowing where they come from. He he says he asked this question as a kind of analogy to his students. He says, true or false, the Twin Towers at 9-11 fell because of gravity. Is that true? Well, yeah, actually, it is true. But it explains nothing about what actually happened to 9-11 and the forces that brought us to that terrible day. He says, similarly speaking, there are things that we, we, we say which are true or false in the culture, but we have no understanding of how we got here, the forces that brought us to this point. I'm going to read to you a quote. It'll be on the screen here from Truman's book. It, it, he talks like a professor, so hang in there. The intuitive moral structure of our modern social imagination, you with me so far? <laughs> Prioritizes victimhood, sees selfhood in psychological terms, regards traditional sexual codes as oppressive and life-denying, and places a premium on the individual's right to determine his or her own existence. All these things play into legitimizing these groups that define themselves in such terms. They capture, one might say, the spirit of the age. The intuitive moral structure of our modern social imagination, like what's going on in people's minds, the collective thinking of the world today, is that the self is supreme. Anybody who tells you different is oppressing you, holding you down, keeping you from living a full life. This is what he calls the spirit of the age, and I think he's exactly right. He goes on to say that the task of the Christian living in a world like this is not to whine about the time that we're in or how things got this way, but to understand the challenges of our moment and to respond biblically and faithfully. So let's get back to what Jesus is telling us about what it means to follow him in Luke 9.23. I want to look through three requirements for living Jesus' way. 
Three requirements for living Jesus' way. He says, if anyone would come after me, in verse, 20, verse 23, we'll just look at verse 23. If anyone would come after me, if anyone, who? Anyone. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. The, the early Christian church was unique in that it, it drew from such a wide strata of society. Rich, poor, male, female, Jew, Greek, educated and uneducated, elites and lower class. If anyone would come after me. So, if you would, follow Jesus. If you're serious about it, if it isn't just talk, he gives us three things. Deny himself or herself, take up his cross, and follow me. We'll talk about them each in turn. There we go. If you want to follow Jesus, let's begin with self-denial. Notice what he does not say. He does not say, if anyone would come after me, let him pray the sinner's prayer. If anyone would follow me, let him accept me into his or her heart. I, I think our churches are full of lots of people who prayed a magic prayer once upon a time where there's been no dying to self. There's been no surrender of life. There's been no regeneration. There's been no transformation. Maybe, maybe that's you. Maybe you're like coming back to church. I've talked to people like this. And uh, you think, well, yeah, I, long ago I, I accepted Jesus into my heart, but nothing's really changed. In fact, my life has been kind of a mess. I can tell you why. It's not a potion or a, or a spell. You say magic words and presto change or you're changed. Those words are to be reflective of a heart that is willing to die to surrender for the one who died for you. you it, the reason is we haven't died to ourselves. We haven't really surrendered anything. Jesus can't be Lord of your life if you still are. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself. Now this doesn't mean the kind of self-denial, like the phrase self-denial, like you might be denying yourself chocolate for a while. Uh, so you can be a Christian and, and have chocolate. Some of you are like, yes, Whew. Right? It doesn't mean like, a, it doesn't mean like self-discipline or, or certain things you cut out of your life for your good. That's not what it's talking about. It means to deny your self. The self. That part of you that wants to call the shots. That part of each of us that wants to be in control, that wants to have its way, that wants to determine what's right and wrong for me and for others, frankly. That's what it means. That's what we're asked to, to deny. To lay that aside. The word deny, it's a Greek word that means to renounce or repudiate, put away, literally. But, but think about it. Our culture is saying, no, 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 no. Center your life on yourself. That internal voice, that sense of who you are, be true to that. And Jesus is saying exactly the opposite. So you can either live self-centered or Jesus-centered. There is no middle ground. Because the gospel is not primarily about getting stuff from God. We've made it that way. We've made it that the gospel is good news. God's gonna bless you. Make you healthy and wealthy and make everything great in your life. Lots of people preaching that message. It's just not in the New Testament. That doesn't mean we don't receive. What we receive is far greater than what we give up. But it means the gospel is not about what we get from God. It's about who he is and what he has done in Christ. And what it means to surrender to that. You, you can't preach a self-serving gospel when the message of the gospel is die to yourself. Second, take up your cross. Now when Jesus said this, I can imagine the disciples, their jaws dropping open. Like what? What did he just say? Take up your what? What? Take up your cross. You have to try to get inside their minds here. The Romans, of course, would compel a condemned person to carry the cross beam through the city, outside the city, to the place of execution, crucifixion. They were famous for this. The reason they did this was to humiliate the condemned and to put them on display for everyone watching in the city. This is what happens if you defy Rome. Don't mess with Caesar. It was a public humiliation and a public shame. Who decides 
to pick up their cross. Who chooses that? This was not language, nobody. You were compelled to do it by force. It was placed on you, tied to you. You were made to do it under the lash. Nobody says, hey, I know what to do. I'm gonna choose to do this. It made no sense to them. The cross, if somebody's carrying a cross, they're not coming back, right? They're going to die. Notice he says, pick up your cross daily. That's a key word, which sometimes I wish wasn't in there. Daily. People don't get crucified daily. Once is usually enough, right? You don't say, hey, Joe, how was your crucifixion today? Oh, it was a rough one. Right? Looking forward to tomorrow. Like you, you, got, you, got, you carried your cross and you died. That was it. So he's not talking about your physical death. But he's saying, following me is a daily exercise in putting to death that part of you that wants to call the shots and have its way. Every day, moment by moment. That's hard. Really hard. The cross is totally incompatible with a life of self-promotion. Think about what the cross symbolized to these disciples. The cross meant official opposition by the government and public opinion. Public shame, extreme suffering, and death. That's what it meant. Jesus saying, do you want me more than you want your reputation, a life of comfort, a life of security? You can't have both. He adds this word daily, as I mentioned, which is, we, I think we think of becoming a Christian as a once upon a time thing. I prayed some prayer long ago and now I'm kind of on my own. That's not what he's saying here. A.W. Tozer wrote a little book called The Radical Cross, Living the Passion of Christ, and he puts this in one of the most compelling ways that I've ever read. I'll read it for you. In every Christian's heart, there is a cross and a throne. And the Christian is on the throne till he or she puts himself on the cross. If he refuses the cross, he remains on the throne. Perhaps this is at the bottom of all the backsliding and worldliness among gospel believers today. We want to be saved but we insist that Christ do all the dying. Next slide. We remain king within the little kingdom of man's soul and wear our tinsel crown with all the pride of a Caesar, but we doom ourselves to shadows and weakness and spiritual sterility. Tozer didn't really mix words. He wasn't known for like soft selling things. In every Christian's heart, there is a cross and a throne. Until we get off the throne, Jesus won't be there. <laughs> I think Tozer is exactly right and deeply convicting. Now this is not easy. Let me let last look at three reasons for living Jesus' way. He gives us three requirements. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. And then he says he doesn't just leave us to like try harder. He gives us three reasons why this, is, this way makes sense, even though it makes no sense to our culture, why it actually is the best way to live and, how, and what power we have for living that way. I want you to notice as we read this passage, there's, uh, there's, there's arguments. There's three times he uses the word for. If you have your Bible, you can circle those. We'll circle them here. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his or forfeits himself? And last, for whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Three reasons he gives us here. First, it's the only way to save your life. If you're trying to be your savior, then Jesus won't be. The only way to save your life, he says, is to lose it, to surrender it. It's like trying to hold water in your hands. You can kind of do it for a while, right? But if you're trying to go on a hike on a hot day in the desert, and this is your water for drinking, how's that going to go? It'll evaporate and run through your fingers. You just can't hold it. The only way to save your life is to let go. 
to lose it, which doesn't, it sounds, sometimes this has been called the, the upside down kingdom or uh, Dallas Willard in his book, um, The Divine Conspiracy, called this the law of inversion. Jesus turns things upside down. They sound like contradictions until we understand it from his perspective. I don't know if there's a more contrary statement for Jesus that he ever made. The only way to save your life is to lose it. If you would try to save it, you will lose it. But if you lose it, for my sake, you'll find it. What? Put it this way. If, if the most important thing to you in your life is your life, you'll never have the life Jesus wants you to have. What's most important to you? What do you treasure most? If it's your health and the life you're building and your success and how you're doing, that is the path to misery. The beautiful inversion is when you give that up, the, the path to fulfillment and joy is to live for something other than yourself. We're told exactly the opposite almost every day. The truth is you can't save your own life. But when you lose it in Christ, he says, for my sake, you have it. You find true salvation, in other words. Second, it's the only way of lasting value. I think I didn't, we got that, where are we? Next, next slide, it's the only way, oh I didn't put the word of in there. But I can, because I have a pen. <laughs> it's the only way of lasting value. Look what he says in verse 25. What does it profit someone if you gain the whole world but lose your very self or your soul? Jim Elliott was martyred uh, for his faith in South America, famously said, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. It's essentially rephrasing what Jesus is saying here. What sense does it make? What, 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 what good is it if you gain the whole world, but you lose what matters most, your very self, your very soul? I've done my share of funerals over the years. They don't bring the U-Haul to your funeral. Pastor Brian's told this story before. I don't know if it's apocryphal or if he did it or if, I can't remember if he heard it from somewhere. If he, but he talks about a guy who was buried in a massive grave in his, in his Cadillac, his, his prized car. They buried him in his Cadillac, which is weird. And then somebody at the funeral leaned over and said, man, that's living. <laughs> no, actually, that's dying. <laughs> and it's, you know. what, is, what sense does it make if you gain the whole world? But what matters most, yourself, your soul, is forfeit because you chase the wrong stuff. It's a bad investment strategy, ultimately. There is no ultimate return on that investment. That's why I use this phrase of gain and loss. Third and finally, it's the only way to eternal glory. If you want to be Lord of your own life, then you can be your own savior too, Jesus is saying. If you're ashamed of me and my words, he says. What does it mean to be ashamed of something? What, what do we do when we're ashamed of someone or something or ourselves? You can go back to Genesis chapter three, find out the reaction. Shame enters the picture because of sin. What's the first thing they do? Hide, cover up, deny, run away from, excuse, In fact, what do all of the disciples do when Jesus is arrested? Deny, hide, avoid, ignore, run away from. But what do they do after the resurrection? Do any of the disciples run away, hide, ignore, deny after the resurrection? They're different men because of the power of the resurrection. Notice the context of the verse Jesus is saying, when I come again. The cross is foolishness to the world now because Jesus came in weakness and humility. And his way of, of, of saving our lives and restoring the whole world is through self-sacrifice, suffering, and death. But he will return, and it will be different. He will return in power and in glory, he says. That is a future worth living for. 
And the way we live for it is by dying to ourself. Paul puts this in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, the best way, I think. If you, wanna, if you don't have a life verse, choose this one. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Let's read that together. You ready? I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What a, what a purpose statement for your life. It's not me anymore. And this is why those who would bristle and reject this idea of not of rejecting the self, denying the self, uh, you know, we want to do, practice self-care and love yourself, that's all well and good on the other side of the cross. Once God has become Lord of your life and restored you and redeemed you and given you a new identity, then he's speaking to your heart and then you trust him and you follow him. But there's this other part of you that this side of heaven is never quite gone that wants to take back control. Do you know that part? Do you know that voice? It says, I know best. That shrinks back when you're confronted. That when you hear or see something that says, this whole Christianity thing is ridiculous. It's part of the problem in the world. That you, mm. That's the part that Jesus says daily. Lay that down. Take up your cross. Your willingness to lay down your life for the one who actually did that for you. All authority and power given to him, which Philippians 2 says he surrendered and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. That at the name of Jesus, someday, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Meaning someday, all will kneel and bow before the Lord Jesus Christ. The question is, will you do that willingly and out of worship, or will you be forced to your knees to acknowledge who he is? Jesus is saying to his disciples right now, I am the Christ, I am the Lord, I am the one you've long awaited for. But my path is not self-promotion, it's self-sacrifice, and so is yours. The only way to have the life that you, that you long for and that I've come to give you is by dying to self and following me. That is a future worth living for. Let's pray. God, we acknowledge that you indeed are the way, the truth, and the life, and frankly, our way, our truth, and our life would look different if it were left up to us. We praise you that it's not that we are not left to our own wisdom and our own choices and our own desires. We are not fundamentally who we think we are or feel ourselves to be. We are who you say we are. And the only way to live a life of fullness and of joy is by laying ourselves down. And the only way we can do that is because you have for us. So we thank and praise you for being the God who would die for us, be raised for us, Give us your Spirit's power, Holy Spirit courage to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow you. And in so doing, find life. We pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Lord Jesus, it's one thing for us to sing it, another thing for us to live it. And I thank you that you're patient with us and gracious to us and merciful. And so help us to surrender all to you, the one who gave all for us. May we go now in the truth and the grace and the glory of your name. Amen. Go in peace.